what I'm going to attempt uh, to not use a microphone as my, most of my training is to project. Uh, people at call centres always tell me that I'm shouting at them. Uh, so I hope, can you all hear me at the back? You can't. You must be able to hear me at the back. I have the loudest voice. You know, I, I'm not sure that I do want to stand up. I'll tell you why. Because it's actually very high here. And I'm you know, giving me a little bit of vertigo. Perhaps, um, perhaps if I stand here and hang on, it'll be... It'll be better. So, and good morning. Um, and I think we're all deeply flattered that you should all want to be here and actually pay to listen to us. So, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for that. I'm in my 46th year in the entertainment business. I know I don't look old enough, but I am. <laughs> uh, I was an actress, an agent, a casting director, a producer, a theatre director, a teacher, and a mentor. And I still do a lot of that stuff. Um, to cast and produce, I don't believe it can be done without having been a performer. I think it's really important that you have the empathy of performing in order to be able to do those things and make actors and technicians and creatives feel comfortable and to give their best. Uh, there are those today working in television and film who I think would disagree, but that's, that's what I believe. Um, I was... My mother went into labour, apparently, watching Judy Garland and Fred Astaire in Easter Parade. And I think it's no surprise that actually I was stage struck from the moment I came out. Um, when I was 18 months old, I caught something called red and gold fever. Anybody know what that is, red and gold fever? It was a trip to the Golders Green Hippodrome, <laughs> where I saw red velvet plush curtains trimmed in gold that swished back and showed a proscenium arch with a fairy tale world there that I wanted to step right into. And from that moment on, I was completely hooked. I never ever wanted to do or be anything else other than to be a storyteller, I think, is, is the, right, the right word for it. Um, soon after that, that, uh, well, that was Cinderella with Arthur Askey. <laughs> <laughs> I was 18 months old and Arthur Askey said, are there any children here who'd like to come up and sing? And my mother turned to see if I wanted to and I was gone. <laughs> I was there. And the interesting thing is that at 18 months old, I had, and this is my great gift, and this is the gift that has seen me through my life, a phenomenal memory. And I was able to sing the entire Zing Went the Strings of My Heart, <laughs> lyric perfect. It wasn't note perfect. None of my singing has ever been note perfect, but it was lyric perfect. Uh, my mother, of course, was horrified. Uh, but soon after, she took me to see Peter Pan. And again, you know, that for me was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. I will remember it always. And indeed, I'm 61, and I think I must have seen 57 different Peters over the years. And I know the play off by heart. But again, you know, it's, it's a play for a great romantic somebody who loves storytelling and listening to stories. Um, I believe that everybody is born with a gift, whether you're able to make a cake, knit a sweater, sing a song, paint wonderful paintings, uh, or just make people feel at ease. But my, I'm very, very lucky. I have two great gifts that weren't apparent all the time I was growing up. It only became apparent in my adult life, in my professional life, when I found that they were better than anybody else's. And that is, first of all, my phenomenal memory. My memory for names, places, people, dates, phone numbers. I mean, almost to the level of, of slight autism. You know, I can still tell you what people's phone numbers were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, the young man I met on holiday when I was 13. And when I see him in the street, I say, oh, hello, Chorleywood 3258. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Um, the other gift I have is the gift of my gut, my, my gut reaction 
which tells me when somebody is special as a performer. Um, and that's really difficult to explain. It's a feeling, a lump in the throat, a filling up of the eyes, a kind of little wrench in the stomach that here is somebody special that I want to see more of. And if I want to see more of them, then I'm sure that all of you would too. And that, those are my two great gifts, and that's what helped me to become a casting director, really, was those two gifts. Um, the other thing I did was read very early. And I read everything, whether it was Enid Blyton or E. Nesbitt or even Dickens. I read them. I also read the Radio Times. <laughs> <laughs> I read the Radio I memorised the cast lists in the Radio Times. I read the credits. I was nine or ten and I read the credits of everything. People got in the way, people still get in the way at the pictures when the film's finished. And I want to read everybody that's done everything. I want to know who everybody is, especially, of course, the actors. So I always did that, always read the credits. Uh, I would cut out cast lists from the Radio Times. Um, and when I was 10 or 11, I got into terrible trouble for defacing library books. <laughs> I would go to the library two or three times a week and I would bring home a book and I would bring the book home, and then I would look at my radio times, and I would look at the names of all the actors and actresses that I had cut out, and I would write the names of the characters in the book, in the front of the play, and then I would write the names of the actors and actresses. And the big one was the railway children. I defaced the railway children, and my mother had to go to Wilsdon Library and pay for the book, because I had written Mother Phyllis Calvert. And my mother said, how did you know that Phyllis Calvert was going to play the mother in the BBC's Railway Children? And I said, I didn't. I just knew she would be the right actress to play it. <laughs> I was ten. We didn't know then that there was a job called a casting director. Um, had we known, life might have been a lot easier for me and I could have headed in that direction. But I didn't then. Um, the other thing that I was really talented at was interfering. <laughs> um, controlling, bossy, and I was responsible for every garage recital and garden show for the length of Sidmouth Road, Wilsdon, for the complete length of it. I mean, um, there's somebody here, you were in one of my shows, Michelle, weren't you? One of my garden recitals. The curtains used to go up on the washing line. All of the local children would be drilled half to death. They'd be dressed from my dressing up box and I would direct and produce the shows and actually charge the neighbours to come and see them. <laughs> so I was stage struck and there was nothing anybody could do about it really. Um, when I was 15 I joined the National Youth Theatre. I was very lucky. I had a really supportive English teacher who knew I wasn't good at much else um, and so suggested that I audition, which I did, and I got in. And my first year, uh, my great job was actually doing the founder, Michael uh, Croft's laundry. Uh, and cleaning his kitchen floor, which I didn't mind at all because I was in the theatre. Um, there was a girl there who was the leading lady. She was 18. She was beautiful and blonde, and she was playing Cleopatra at the Old Vic. And I ran and fetched for her. I carried her handbag. I ran and got her coffee. I ran down to Marine Ices because we rehearsed in Haverstock School to get her her ice cream. I polished her crown. I did everything for Helen. Because I just, <laughs> she was amazing. Um, I had other contemporaries in the youth theatre. Timothy Dalton, um, one of the James Bonds. David Suchet. Suchet and I were in a play called A Bartholomew Fair, a Jacobean comedy at the uh, Royal Court. Um, other actors, Kenneth Cran and David Calder, all my contemporaries in the National Youth Theatre. Uh, Diana Quick, Paula Wilcox and Alfred Molina. All still chums today. You know, so it was a fantastic place to grow up in. When I was 16 and a half, the National Youth Theatre did a play called Zigazaga, which some of you may remember. It was an extraordinary success. It was the first time there would ever been 80 young people on stage, and it was like a Greek chorus of football fans. And even then, 1967, you know, the newspapers were full of football hooliganism, and, and, and this was a play about that. Um, and I played one of the leading roles. It was a huge success, it won awards, it got fantastic notices, people queued up to get in. Ralph Richardson kissed me, um, you know, John Gilgood sent me a letter of congratulations. It was just the most amazing time for a 16 and a half, 17 year old. And uh, a 
West End producer decided he was going to take the show into the West End and he said, I'll take those two boys and that girl, and the rest were professional actors. I left school, my parents were horrified, um, and I went into the West End to be in Zigazaga, which folded after two weeks. So, so there I was, but I did have a very sensible dad who insisted that I learn how to type. Um, so I did. Uh, I can segue on a few years now, but in the interim period, these few years, I did things like I worked in the television casting department of um, Yorkshire Television, which was then one of the uh, independent television franchises starting up. I was a junior agent at the William Morris office, big William Morris office, kind of uh, care of the wonderful late Bobby Littman, who some people might remember, who was a Wilsdon boy who became a big Hollywood agent. Um, CMA, which was another big American agency. I worked for an American film producer who lived in Connaught Square in the house that the Blairs now occupy, actually. Um, I worked for the most fantastic man called Alexander H. Cohen, who was a Broadway producer and I think the last of the great showmen. He was the, ma the man who took um, Beyond the Fringe to Broadway. And when he took Beyond the Fringe to Broadway, he imported a route master bus. He sailed it over to New York in order to transport all of his guests to the opening night of, uh, of Beyond the Fringe. He also was the first man to have Yves Montand in the theatre, and he replaced the water in the fountain of the theatre with champagne on opening night uh, because of the Frenchman. Um, uh, I was also an actress... Uh, an out-of-work actress a lot of the time, but I was really lucky. Jonathan Lynn and George Layton wrote a character in the Doctor series called Crystal, the Dean's Daughter, and I got to be Crystal, the Dean's Daughter, and every now and again you can see me on one of those dreadful satellite channels looking very young and being not very good, actually. Uh, I was in Sunday Bloody Sunday for John Schlesinger, where I got to share a scene with Peter Finch, most of which ended up on the cutting room floor, but was a fantastic experience. I was also leading lady at The Mermaid. I did a play by Bernard Cox called Enter Solly Gold, about a fat, unmarriageable Jewish girl. Have you seen it? My sister was in it. Who's your sister? Pamela Madsen. Oh, God, yes, of course. <laughs> we were together, yes. Um, oh, I miss her. Um, and we had the most fantastic time doing that. Um, so, you know, my life as an actress was sporadic. There weren't a lot of parts for fat Jewish girls. And when people did write them, I did get them to play. Um, actually, I'm thinking back of going to it now. I'm so fed up with seeing the same actresses play Jewish mothers on television. I'm sure I could do as good a job. <laughs> um, the jobs that I had. Um, all of those jobs with Alexander Cohen, with John Bernard, with people like that, were all fascinating, and yeah, I could really, I could write a book about it, and if I say things to you like, through those years, you know, I uh, had an altercation with Lauren Bacall when I lost her luggage on the way to New York, which was very scary. Um, I got donuts for Peter Ustinov, who then bounced a check on me. Um, I had tea with... Richard Burton, while Elizabeth slept in the other room because her back was bad. Um, I took Sammy Khan, the legendary lyricist, to Shul in po Poland Street, one Yom Kippur, because he had nowhere to go and didn't know how to get to a shul. Um, and I arranged for James Stewart to have a cap fitted on his tooth on Easter Monday. And ha you know, had to call on family, really, to find a, an emergency dentist to, to, sort, uh, to sort James Stewart out. Um, I showed Rod Steiger a house. <laughs> All kinds of things happened to me over the years. But in 1976, I decided to be a freelance casting director. I'd done a lot of casting for Alex Cohen. I'd done a play with Mike Nichols called Comedians on Broadway, um, where actually we found a young man uh, who was spearholding in Canada called Larry Lamb. You might know him better as Archie Mitchell. His first job was actually on Broadway in comedians that Mike Nichols directed that, that I cast. Um, and I decided to set up by myself. Now, it, there, in those days, there were maybe 15, 20 casting directors in England. Uh, the three best were the late, great Miriam Brickman, who was, had been casting director at the Royal Court and 
as I started casting, she became ill and, and did die in the mid-70s. Um, the wonderful Maud Spector, who went on for years and who was, uh, she was contracted to Disney. She did all the <coughs> Disney's casting, so any new person for Disney, uh, Maud had found. The amazing Jenny Arisa, who had fled with her Jewish family from a Bolshevik Russia and become Edgar Wallace's secretary and then turned into the great casting director of Oliver, the, the movie, and all of the Anglia programs, uh, Tales of the Unexpected, everything like that. She went on working until she was 80-something. Um, and then Rose Shaw, Rose, Rose Tobias Shaw, who's American and is still with us and living not far from here. Uh, there were four great Jewish casting ladies, and they were people to aspire to, actually. <coughs> there were another lot who didn't want me there, who wanted me out. I was an upstart. <laughs> I was a know-all. I said what I thought. I was a maverick. I've always been a maverick. And it was difficult. They, they tried to stop me. There was, in those days, a union. And they wouldn't let me join the union, and they said I couldn't join the union until I had a film to cast, and I couldn't have a film to cast because I was a mem until I was a member of the union. <laughs> so I was blessed because there were some boys around who were making commercials. They were bright young men in advertising. They'd all gone into advertising straight from school, and they were called Alan Parker, Adrian Lyne, Hugh Hudson. Uh, people like that, people that have now become great, great filmmakers and storytellers. These young men, they hired me to cast their commercials. Um, and they saved my life, really. There was Ridley and Tony Scott, who had, you know, a little production company called RSA. It's still a production company called RSA, but it's a huge worldwide international production company, and these boys hired me to cast their commercials, so I would cast their little, immaculate 30-second films. You know, for Parker, I did a whole series going around the country finding children, because that's what he was famous for. Um, and then, of course, when it came to them doing their films, I got included in. Um, as an actress, I had worked twice with a wonderful director, um, a Liverpool lad called Alan Clark. Uh, BAFTA give an award every year now in memory of Alan Clark. He was a great, great storyteller. Uh, the most, of course, I suppose the most controversial film that he ever made was Scum, um, which was a really groundbreaking film of the late 70s. Um, the BBC didn't have casting directors, so Alan needed help uh, when casting Scum. I had been to Stratford East three weeks before because, as a casting person, that's what you did. You went to the theatre. You went to the theatre eight times a week. I would, I, you know, I would go everywhere. I would go two shows a day. I would go to every pub theatre, every provincial theatre. Um, kind of bank holiday weekends were spent touring the north of England, you know, going to York Rep, Liverpool Rep, Liverpool Playhouse, Manchester Library just seeing everything and everybody that was there, because you're only as good as the people that you can cast. Um, I'd been to see something called What a Crazy World at Stratford East, which was a musical, and in it was a 16-year-old boy who I knew was the son of a greengrocer from Enfield who soft-shoed and sang and had just the most enormous charisma. That was one of the moments when the gut went, mm. Brought him into the BBC, he came with a friend of his, and he walked down a corridor, and Alan Clark saw him walking down a corridor and said, who is that? Who is that that walks like John Wayne? <laughs> 16. And I said, I'm bringing him in now. He's called Ray Winston. <laughs> um, and there was the start of Ray's career. Um, casting is a series of coincidences being in the right place at the right time. You don't always get your first choice in the cast. You know, do you know who the first choice was for Indiana Jones? <coughs> Can't imagine it being anybody else other than Harrison Ford, can you? <coughs> Tom Selleck. Oh. And they wouldn't let him out of Magnum in order to be it. God, things would have been really different, wouldn't they? Um, so in the 70s, I went on to be a leading casting director. I cast 
something called quadrophenia, which as well as, as Ray Winston had uh, Phil Daniels in it, a very young Leslie Ash, uh, who I had found because she was a model, a photographic model, a teenage photographic model, and she had the right look. And then here's another interesting story about a gut reaction. Um, I knew an actress, a really great actress, who was married to a school teacher who was in a band. He was a bit surly, a Geordie, a bit chippy, but he had this amazing kind of blonde, spiky hair. And we couldn't find for Quadrophenia the character called the Ace Face, which was a young man who was head and shoulders taller than everybody else, who was just special, who you just needed to look at. He didn't have very many lines in the film, but he needed to look special. And I woke up one morning and thought, I'm going to get Francis Tomalty's husband in for this. So I phoned her agent and said, could he come in? And he came in and Frank Rodden, the director, said, we've done it, we've cracked it. This is the man that's going to play the ace face. He was called Gordon Sumley. You'll know him better as Sting. <laughs> <laughs> In 1979, Hugh Hudson, for whom I'd made lots and lots of commercials, phoned me. I was on holiday in America, and he phoned me and said, when can you come back? And I said, well, I've only just got here. And he said, no, we need you to come back. We're doing a film. It's about a Jewish runner. You must be the person that does it. And I said, why? Because I'm Jewish? And he said, yes. Of course, it wasn't just about a Jewish runner. It was about a lot of runners, and it was Chariots of Fire. And I started um, casting that in November of 1979. And um, it won the Oscar in 1981. Somebody phoned me that night and said, it's just won the Oscar, you can double your fees. And I did, and the Americans paid it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that same year, I worked with John Houston. I did a film with um, Senor Fellini called And the Ship Sailed On, which was a remarkable experience. How I, where else do you go? I'd only been doing it seven or eight years, although people still think of me as a casting director. I, I was doing the movie of Supergirl, and I was casting a series for uh, HTV called Robin of Sherwood, and I was casting American miniseries, and I was doing The Canterville Ghost with Sir John Gilgood, and I was really, really busy. But actually, I was no longer being stretched, and I was no longer being fulfilled. And I didn't really know what else to do with my life. And then the man that I was casting Robin of Sherwood with said to me, do you know what, I've had enough of being in Bristol. I don't want to be in Bristol for the next three years. Why don't you come and produce this series? And I said, I can't do that. I don't know what to do. And he said, of course you would. You're life's greatest interferer. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what being a producer is, is interfering in what, what goes on. You interfere in everything. You interfere in the script. You interfere in the costumes. You interfere in the location. You interfere in what the... Caterers are going to give you for lunch. You, know, you interfere in everything. And of course, it's the most perfect job for me. So I went to do it. Um, it was, actually it was terrifying, because the very first episode that I, the first day of shooting, of the first episode that I was producing, I was by myself. The lead guest actor, Oliver Tobias, who was skilled with the broadsword, actually slipped and tore a ligament. And we had it on film, we had it on camera. You actually heard the ligament tear as he went down with this huge, heavy broadsword. So my very first day as a producer was handling an insurance claim. So, you know, if I could do that, I could do anything. Um, I made another about 21 episodes of Robin of Sherwood. Got fantastic guest stars to be in it. Once you get one, you get them all. Um, I had Patricia Hodges, a mad queen. I had Cyril Cusack. I had Dorothy Tootin. I even brought in some old guys that you'll remember. Um, from <laughs> I remember them. Remember the delicious Michael Craig and George Baker? Yeah. They were movie stars in the 50s and 60s. Got them in as fabulous character actors. Um, Ian Ogilvie came to do one. Lewis Collins came to do one. Martin Shaw came to do one. I got really, really good people. Uh, we started guest casting. And that was because I would think outside the box and I would get somebody to do something that they weren't automatically known for. It was casting against type. Um, after that, I went to Central Television. The great, great days of Central Television. I lived in Birmingham for three years and I made something called Boom um, with Michael Elphick. And I was given a fabulous uh, script editor, a woman called Tracy Hoffman, who went on to be head of drama at, at Carlton Television. Um, and together we reformatted it and I got... Uh, one of the students that I taught at Guildhall, a young lad, again, who 
had given me that gut when he, uh, he had arrived from Stoke-on-Trent, having come from a children's home with two pounds in his pocket and one change of underwear, um, and didn't eat, and we found out that he wasn't eating when I was teaching him at Guildhall, and I used to take him out for lunch every day because it was so horrifying, and buy him, you know, packets of, of cereal to take back to the floor that he slept on. Um, but we needed a lanky, dopey Midlander, and we created the role for <coughs> Neil Morrissey, and of course, from then on, he became Neil Morrissey, you know, and is very, very well known today. Um, I got Amanda Burton. The minute I knew she was leaving Brookside, I was on the next train up to Liverpool to persuade her to come and be in Boone with us. Um, Boone was a trial and tribulation. Our leading man, God rest his soul, was a drunk. And it was really, really difficult. Um, really difficult. But I had, you know, at that stage, I had a young man who was um, house-sitting for me. Again, another gut reaction. Somebody I'd found in the National Youth Theatre who was 19, who'd just come to London, who was... Um, auditioning for drama schools, and he was living in my house, and he came up and was an extra for me. Uh, he was looking after my cat and, and taking care of the house, and his name was Daniel Craig, so... <laughs> <laughs> the gut works. It does. Um, in 1988, Lo and Moe, Morris and Lawrence, came and asked me to head their production company. I had been a freelancer for so many years. I had never been beholden to anybody, really. I never got any paid holidays, I never got any sick pay, I worked for myself. If I didn't work, then I didn't eat, and the mortgage didn't get paid, and, um, you know, that was it. Am I doing all right time-wise? Is that all? <coughs> right, okay. So, um, I then joined Morris and Lawrence, and we went into the BBC as the first independent production company um, under the new broadcasting laws. It was difficult. It was not what I meant. It was not the way I was used to program making. Uh, John Burke brought in something I thought immensely sensible called um, uh, producer's choice, where you were given your budget and you were allowed to spend it as you saw fit, doing the best deals for everything. So you would get the best deal for the caterers, the best deal for the lighting company, the best deal for the actors, the best deal for the wardrobe. Uh, you would do the best deals. The BBC weren't used to that. Now, I'm a great believer in a public service broadcaster, but I'm not great, a great believer in jobs for the boys. And I was in great conflict with many people at the BBC the whole time I was producing Birds of a Feather. Uh, they were sexist, without doubt. They didn't like the independents. They didn't want us there. They were spending what was our money <clears throat> on what they thought was important rather than what we thought was important. Um, and I got a lot of flack from the controllers of comedy about the content of the first series of Birds of a Feather. After the first series, I left. I mean, I, I didn't produce any more Birds of a Feather. It wasn't what I meant. It became, for me, and you, know, you may disagree, something that was incredibly vulgar, too vulgar, and not really about two women surviving by themselves, which is what the initial plan had been. Um, interestingly, again, I did. There was a job for the boys there. My very old chum, Leslie, who had spent 24 years being Maureen Lippman's understudy and doing three or four lines in something, actually got to be Dorian and made it her complete and utter own. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Dorian Green and her nails are now a legend uh, <laughs> in, in television history. Um, so it, it was it, making the Birds of a Feather the first series was not the happiest experience. While there, with Lawrence and Morris, I pitched Love Hurts, which went on for three or four series, which initially was going to be a Patricia Hodge, Adam Faith uh, series, rather than Zoe Wanamaker. Um, I pitched something which I thought was a genius idea, a comedy set in Northern Ireland called So You Think You've Got Troubles? <laughs> uh, about the Jews in Northern Ireland, um, which... If they'd have given it time, I think it would have really taken off. <laughs> I thought it was a really, really good idea because the controller of BBC One had said, what can we do about Northern Ireland that's not going to offend anybody? And I said, we can talk about the Jews in Northern Ireland. And he said, what Jews in Northern Ireland? And I said, oh, come on. And, and you know, we did it. We made the series. Um, after that, I, I, mean, I did go back and work with Lawrence and Morris again later on, and this time they let me have my head, and the BBC were... Um, a little more understanding. 
But you know, as I've only got five more minutes, I'll just go on to say that um, I made a show that I'm the proudest of ever, which was something called Nightingales, which about seven people saw, which was on late night television on Channel 4 with Robert Lindsay, David Threlfall, and the wonderful James Ellis. Remember Bert Lynch from the yeah. Zenithars? And it was about three night watchmen who lived in this peculiar, Pinteresque, never world of, yeah. of and it was and I it still gets named in people's top tens. It's in Ricky Gervais's top ten. So you know it's obscure, but I'm so proud of it. Um, and I then made any manner of programs. Um, I made documentaries about killer diseases, I made documentaries about aeroplane crashes, I made uh, the first uh, what I call Poor People series, which was called Secondhand Rose, which was for daytime television with Linda Bellingham, where each week she had a clothes party, or she went to a car boot sale, or she did an auction, or she sold things from her house, long before any of this bargain hunt or car booty or whatever it is you see. Now, I mean, we really broke new ground in that respect. And I made hundreds of programmes, all different kinds of programmes. I made pop programmes for the CBBC. I did everything that there was to do. Um, and in 2001, 2001, I kind of decided, you know what? This is not the business I came into. This is no longer about storytelling. When I was at Central Television, for example, um, they would say to me, we would like 13 episodes of Boone. We would like it next May. Here is the money. Here is your leading actor. Can you go away and make it? And I would go away and make it. I would commission the scripts, the script writers, um, and I indeed found a whole load of new, interesting young writers as well. Um, and I would commission them, we'd cast it, we'd make it, we'd put the music on it, we'd edit it, we'd deliver it to Central Television and the ITV network, we'd give them change from their three million pounds, and, and we would get 16 million viewers on a Wednesday night. It doesn't happen anymore. Everything today is done by committee. It's cast by committee. Television people, with the exception of Downton Abbey, are running scared. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're making. Too many people, too many opinions, too many people wondering whether it will get ratings, too many channels to compete against. You know, you don't get those kind of millions anymore. So I stopped making television. I carried on directing in the theatre, mentoring young writers, young actors, young directors. Um, I've even found somebody here I'm going to mentor today, Charlotte, very good. She found me, she networked. Um, and um, I run a school, I run two schools as well for children, for little ones. If you're familiar with musicals, um, I'm now Mama Rose from Gypsy. Um, I have about 200 children that we teach and represent. We teach singing, music, dance, drama, and I, we have an agency. I've got a child at the National Theatre now. I've got another one doing the film of Horrid Henry. Um, and I've become a very, very successful middle class and a share. So, you know, things are really good. And it's been 46 years. I hope it'll be 66 years. I hope I've got another 20 to do. And um, I thank you all for coming. My time's up, probably, isn't it? <laughs>